Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for being on today. I'm so excited about our interview with uh, the famous Dr. Kim Kimberling, uh, the founder, president of Awesome Marriage. I have been so impressed uh, with, with Awesome Marriage and uh, with how God has been using Awesome Marriage to change people's lives, change families, literally change the world. So uh, Dr. Kim, welcome today. Uh, I'm so excited to, to get to interview you and uh, really, it's not really an interview, but just more of a talk. But um, I wanted you to tell me a little bit about Awesome Marriage. Well, thanks for having me. You know, we've been friends for quite a while now. And of course, I love what family ID. I see the difference in families. So it is. It's great to connect with you. And it's an honor to be on with you today. Awesome yeah. Marriage is 10 years old. We just celebrate our, our wow. 10th anniversary. Uh, it started out really just out of a group of guys uh, sitting around thinking, what can we do for marriage? You know, what are we, what's not doing? How do we reach people? And wow. at that time, Facebook was in pages and said, well, we'll do a Facebook page. And from that, we saw an incredible response, especially when we asked people what we could pray for them, for their marriages. And so wow. it just, from there, God just kept taking it different things. And now we have, um, we have resources that come out every month to help people. We have an email that goes out five days a week. That one thing you can do for your marriage. We have podcasts, two podcasts. One's called A Better Man and one's Awesome Marriage Podcast. And Awesome Marriage Podcast has just grown incredibly. And then just we do a lot of videos just everywhere technology is we try to be. So you might find us somewhere and you think, why are we there? Well, the reason we're there is because God's message for marriage needs to be everywhere. Wow. You know, uh, Kim, I was so uh, impressed with, this has probably been three or four years ago, that you had, um, how many how many followers do you have on Facebook? Because you really have a big Facebook. We have group. about, yeah, we have 100,000 on Facebook and we have uh, close to 100,000 on Twitter. Uh, Instagram's less, it's around 20,000, I think. And then, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's interesting. We've been on TikTok for a couple of months. And we just had one of our videos go over two hundred thousand. So that's. Uh, I wish they all did that, but but this well, one happened to go. So you know, it's it's just interesting. Um, we try to do things that gets people's attention, and then hopefully they listen, and hopefully it helps them. Oh, that's that's so cool. And you know, for you to have that that kind of reach and to be able to impact that number of people and that number of families is, is incredible to me. How, how did you know that helping couples have an awesome marriage was your purpose? How did, how did that come to you? Kind of share, share how you came to that. Uh, really yeah, it's probably, well, obviously when it's an opportunity, I started teaching a prep for marriage course in 96 and okay. through that and would follow some of the couples. But then in 2007, I think it was, my pastor, Craig Rochelle, uh, wrote a book called Kazone, and Kazone was basically find out what God wants you to do now, and out of going through that very slowly, uh, really over a summer, it said, okay, there's a marriage ministry here. This is, this is what you're to do, and so I just kind of kept that in mind, and then a year or so later, the opportunity opened up. Uh, I started doing stuff with Life Church, uh, what was called the internet campus then, and they do kind of a live deal. And I was with them a lot. We were helping them answer marriage questions. And out of those four guys and me is where Austin Marriage was really birthed. And oh, uh, wow. Wow. So, so those were the beginnings. It was and you know, it's like one of those things you don't know, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? We felt God leading us to do it. And right. then, and it took off like crazy. It was one of the, the, the idea of, you know, you take off your plane and you're still building it. Well, we felt that way. Oh, and we still do feel that way but we have a team now of about 10 people and we do everything in-house we do all of them video and audio editing and uh, graphic art and we've just got a great great team of people that love what we're doing love marriage and and love the lord and so it's very very it's, it's a great group to work with that's so cool you know you mentioned uh that you went through uh the process of developing your kazone or your 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 vision or your identity um and so tell me about that process. Uh, what, what did you, how did that book, Kazone, help you determine what your identity is and what your purpose was? I think the book, as I remember, I've been, I was going to look at it not too long ago, and I, so I got it down. I want to read my notes of what I wrote 13 years ago. But as I remember, it was, it was kind of the process you go through and, and just uh, 
Craig leads us through and it just became very evident and, and it just kind of has narrowed things down. Um, it, it really, I, when I saw the book, it gave God a chance to really talk to me and for uh -huh. me to listen to him because I was focused on that. And That's so I, I think by That's doing good. that, uh, through that is when it came out. Okay. And, and so then I knew what he wanted me to do. And, I, and then he says, well, just wait a minute. And uh, so we waited uh, a year, year and a half, and then things started happening. Oh, that's so good. Well, I, I tell you, we, you know, having a family identity, uh, having a, an intentional direction, uh, how, how does that impact? How, do, how would a family identity impact a marriage? How, how have you seen those who have somewhat of a, 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 a vision yeah. of, of, of what they're supposed to do? How have you seen that impact marriage? The sad thing is I see very few people do that, honestly. Uh, the okay. good thing is when you do see a couple that has done that well together, they've thought, talked, brainstormed, just kind of got, looked forward. What do we want? You know, I think that I'm with, you know, when ours are gone, what do we want our marriage to look like? What do we want to have invested in the kids through them? And, you know, what their purpose is as a family. It makes all the difference in the world because they, they've done this together and they're on the same page. And, you know, one of the things that's always hard in marriage is couples come in, they think they're so much alike, they find out how different they are and they start fighting those differences instead of coming together. Well, this is a place to come together. And once you agree on that, I think the other things fall into place, especially if God's at the center of it. It, it just things in the place. And it's like we talk all the time, God's first spouse, second. Well, if I'm first keeping God first, there's nobody else that goes in second place but Nancy. And I think when you have a vision like that, then things just begin to fall into place and make a difference. In, in counseling people who have done that, and you know, just because you've done a, a family vision doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect marriage. You're still going to have things to struggle, but I think it gives you more of a foundation to come from. And so what I see in some of those couples, it's more helping them work through maybe a, a life stage change. Maybe it's the kids that were so cute at eight, nine, and 10 are now 13, 14, 15. It's like, you know, we thought we were good parents and now we don't know. And, and so it's seeing them kind of get back on and helping them see that that family vision that they did when the kids were young. Yeah. Yeah. That's still applicable. And, and that's something you continue to do. So yeah, at Family ID, we are focused on helping families write, put in writing their family core values, uh, setting down together and determining what, what are we going to agree upon as a family as to what our yeah. core values are. Um, you know, tell me what, uh, when, when you're dealing with a family that's kind of in crisis right now, that's, uh, we realize there are so many families out there that are, um, they don't really seek out help until they are really, really hurting. Right. right? So Absolutely. By, the time, by the time they get to you, they, they're like, they're on their last leg. So tell me, how do you, how do you help a family that's really in a crisis right now? What, what, what have you seen cu couples coming to you and saying, we need help with? Oh gosh. Uh, I think a lot of it goes back to communication. Because okay. if you don't communicate well, you don't understand each other. You make, start making assumptions. You have expectations that you don't communicate. And they may be realistic, but if, if they're not communicated, your spouse doesn't know if that's an expectation you have. Okay. So I think a lot of those things fall into place. And then, I, you know, we live in a culture that is uh, uh, sexuality is a big part of it. And so okay. the idea of pornography, um, affairs, emotional and physical i mean those are i see a lot more of that today than i did right 20 years ago for sure wow. uh, the thing is that those people are coming to counseling maybe there were that many people before they just didn't come to counseling right. but but That's but right. i see the you know my pastor asked me one time he said when you're counseling people if you can just get them to do one thing that makes a difference what is it and, and i told him i said pray together if i can get a couple to invite god into their marriage Right. then things begin to change. It makes them wow. see how wow. God wants to treat each other, you know, and how, and that God's got a purpose and a plan for this marriage and you honor that covenant and you don't give up on it. And I think so good. way That's too good. many couples get in and probably because they don't have a, a vision, Greg. And, and so right. things get tough and they go, well, we'll just, we'll just blow this deal up and, you right. know, I'll start over somebody else instead of honoring that covenant and, and trusting God to build something out of it. It, wow. it saddens me when I see a couple that's only been married a few years get divorced 
because I know what Nancy and I went through. I know the struggles we went through and where we are today because of those struggles. And so if you don't go through those struggles, you, you don't get to the, the promised land of marriage, you know, oh, the, and it can be promised land all the way through, but to where you feel like man, we know that whatever happens with God's help, we can go through it. Oh man. And so that's where you want to get. I love that. I, I love the fact that you kind of just shared what would be a, if you could help a couple put in writing some core values that would absolutely bless their marriage. It, they would truly have an awesome marriage if they gave, if they had, what would you say would be a core value that a, that a, that a couple could put down on paper and it would really bless their marriage. And I heard the first one there, pray together. So, pray together, absolutely, and and I, you know, I think that scares some people, and I think it scares guys more than it does women, okay. uh, because you know, women do Bible studies and prayer groups, and guys, we we have Bible study, but we talk about the football game, and so you know, we're just right, not right. real good at that. Right. So I'm just just start slow, pick it, may say, hey God, we want better communication in our marriage. So you just both pray that, hold hands and pray it separately, or you can pray That's out loud. Just don't make good. it complicated. Doesn't have to, you don't have to be a pastor saying that. If you can pray, if I can get a couple to pray a minute a day and they haven't been <laughs> praying before, there's going to be a difference That's because so they're good. just connecting that way. So prayer is obviously one. I love the, the other thing that I, that I see is so good now, Greg, is I used to have guys that would kind of think, okay, I've got to do this leadership thing. Uh, I want to read the Bible with my wife. How do I do that? And I'd say, well, just pick something. And then the guy come in and say, well, I opened it and it was Leviticus and I, I didn't know what to do. You know, And so now we've got the YouVersion Bible app. Now we have Bible plans. Now you can read purposefully through the Bible right. and you can do all those together now. And now Nancy and I read through the Bible together every year and we pick one of the plans. We don't read it at the same time, but there, if you share it with someone, you can put comments. You can say, this is what I think God said today, or I don't get this. What did you get out of this? So yeah. reading the Bible gives us a way to grow and it keeps us kind of focused on where God wants us to be. The other, I think uh, that I would say are very important, um, really the way you treat respect, I mean, and loving, being kind to each other. That's probably the word I, that I, that I feel like people need more than anything right now is, is grace, kindness toward each other. And I think we live in a culture that doesn't give that very well. Yeah. Um, and so I think when you see a couple that is and is willing to listen uh, to their spouse, and even if they don't understand, to try to come alongside their spouse. So the other, one of the things that we talk a lot about at Awesome Marriage is being a team. And the, if I can get a couple to see themselves as a team, it makes all the difference in the world. Because usually it's like, we got a problem here, he's here, she's here, and they're fighting over the problem. And if you can get them to, to pivot and stand side by side with the problem in front, it makes uh -huh. all the difference in the world. Then it's how the problem, it's not me solving or Nancy solving, it's how should this problem be solved and how can we do that together? So those wow. are some things that I think really make a difference just practically. And yeah. for most couples, it's just helping them rethink things. And then to see, when they begin to do that, to see the results. It's like, man, we were fighting every day and now, now we might argue a little bit, but we get back as a team and we're, we're moving forward. And so, oh, and I think you've got to be in that position to, to, to set your family idea. You've got to be, see yourself as a team because I think the danger would be if, I, if Nancy came home and said, hey, I saw this guy, Greg Gunn. He is so good. I bought this stuff and I want us to do that. And I'm going, I don't want to do that. You know, you've got to both be on the same page. And so she's That's got true. to come in and say, and begin to talk about it and see the value and let him kind of right. come along. And it goes both ways because when a couple gets on the same page with it, this awesome things can happen. Wow, that's so good. So I hear a core value for having an awesome marriage would be to pray together and then read the Bible together. Um, and then uh, the third one, what kind of, can you encapsulate a third core value for, for an awesome marriage would be uh, in the area of, of being kind to each other, that we choose. Yeah, I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe it's just the golden rule. Yeah, maybe it's just do it to others is, you know, we want them to do it to us. And, and uh, a big part of that too, I think is empathy. I think sometimes it's hard for us to empathize with our spouse. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think when we can do that, when we can say, how does this, how does this look through her eyes? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and try to at least do that or try to understand. And, yes. you know, sometimes we don't completely understand, but, but learning to accept, accept each other. I think that's acceptance is a big part of it. Okay. And I'm not talking acceptance that my husband goes out to strip clubs every night. Not that kind of acceptance. I'm talking just accept that 
she's male, I'm fe- she, she's the female, I'm the male. Right. We both grew up in different homes. We, right. we saw things different. And so this is something, this is a deal breaker. This is something I can accept and live with. That's and, so and, you know, just like accepting, because we were trying to, we try to change each other. Nancy and I did that for about three years. We just tried right. to change each other into this mold that she had of what a husband should be and me of what a wife should be. And right. finally I'd said, why don't you let me make her into the wife that you need? And I thought, that's a good deal. That's, that's a, a good, good idea. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea. How about that? <laughs> you that's know? so good. So, you know, I, I've noticed uh, in dealing, um, we deal with, with we have a, a, a men's group that we call Fight Club where uh, these men are fighting for their marriage and fighting for their yeah. for their family. Um, and one of the things we've seen that has really uh, caused a lot of problems in marriage and, and really in the family is a lot of unforgiveness uh, that, mm-hmm. that uh, either one of the spouses are holding on to a lot of past offenses. And that unforgiveness is... How have you seen unforgiveness affect families and affect marriages? It's a death knell. I mean, uh, it, it is. It's that severe because I think unforgiveness goes into, you get into more anger and bitterness and it just, I mean, it just can consume someone. And, and I get it. I'll have people say, well, you don't know what he did or how they hurt me. And I said, no, right. I don't, but God does. And God says, yeah. forgive. And he forgave you and me. And so we got to work. And sometimes I'll say, okay, just ask God to just pray and say, God, help me to get where I I can forgive. Just whatever step it takes, God's going to walk it through you. It's not like, because some people can't just say, okay, I forgive you. And it's over. That's mean, sometimes it's a process. And so you've you've got to, forgiveness is, um, it and really who it hurts more than me is the person who's holding it. I see. Because, you know, and so I think when you forgive, I think, um, can't remember who said, but there's a freedom that comes with that. I you feel see. like a weight slipped it off your shoulder. I, I, I can't remember who said it. The quote was, when you forgive, you realize you set a prisoner free and the prisoner was you. Uh, and I think we don't realize until we unforgive. I mean, that's off of our yeah. shoulders and we're not carrying that anymore because if you're trying, you know, if you're waiting for someone to um, do something to earn your forgiveness, that's probably not going to happen. They're never going to measure up that way. Ooh, that's good. You know, I've, I've noticed that when it comes to um, trying to forgive someone, a lot of people think that they, they need to feel forgiving toward that person. But if they have been hurt, really hurt by their spouse, or uh, they've been hurt by a parent, they were, they were abused and in, in whatever, um, they're thinking, you know what, I just can't feel it. And if I'm supposed to feel it, uh, I don't think I can ever get there. So tell me, is can you can you forgive someone without feeling forgiving toward them? I think it's a choice you make. Okay. Uh, I mean, you really look at it. Jesus did make a choice to go on the cross. He could have called about a, a million angels down and stopped that. So it is a choice that you make. I and Jesus said from the cross, "Father, forgive them." So I think um, I know it. You may not feel like it, but I think it's okay, God. With your help, I'm going to choose to forgive. I don't want to. I don't feel like it but I know that's what you want me to do. And I think obedience pays off. I think God, and I think the feet, and, and it may not be some warm feeling toward that person someday, but you know, I had a, a lady one time and her husband had an affair. Uh, he divorced her and she blamed it all on the other woman. And uh, she and I worked through a lot of that forgiveness. And so probably eight years later, she calls me on Christmas Eve and she said, I'm at Christmas dinner with my daughter and her husband their family and i'm sitting guess who i'm sitting next to what you sitting next to that other woman and they oh. she had forgiven and here that she was sitting next to the woman she said i will never look at and having christmas dinner with her so wow it, it's amazing what god can do when you you do that and then you just kind of leave it in his hands and i think wow. i think of another lady that had been abused by um an uncle i guess when she was growing up and so i'd work with her used to point to forgive she said but i want to I do want to confront him. And so I right. went with her and her husband and we, it was in another state and we wow. sat in a, a church uh, in a circle. And she told him that, you know, she knew what he did because I think he thought she didn't remember. And she said, <laughs> I forgive you. We walked out of there. 
she said my boundary is I'm not I don't want to be around him anymore but I forget that that okay. is all and if God leads me to be there fine but you know you can still set boundary maybe people need to hear that you can forgive somebody and still protect yourself you know if you're if you're in an abusive relationship you can make yourself safe forgive your spouse for abusing you but that doesn't mean you open the door and say right. come back right. in and you know no it's like I, but I can't live with you because of right. being abused right. I see. That's good. And that's, that's, that's a, there is a difference between uh, forgiving someone and then, you know, trying to set up a boundary so that, so that you're not being hurt or your children are not being hurt. You know, something I've noticed right. when I've dealt with, with uh, these, these families and that, that are dealing with um, unforgiveness and just dealing with problems. They don't even know why they have the problems. They just know that things aren't, if they had to rate their marriage on a scale of one to 10, it would be a two. Uh, and yes. so, uh, but one of the things I've seen as well, and how do you help people for really the, the, the person that's one of the hardest people to forgive is themselves. Um, because yes. we, we all know our own, we, we know our own junk. I'm, I, I know my own, <laughs> my own failings. I know my own, yes. you know, I know stuff that nobody in this world knows about me because I've never shared it with anybody. Right? <laughs> so right. How do I, how do, how do we forgive ourselves? What, what, have, what, 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 how would you lead a, a, a person in a counseling situation to forgive sure. themselves? I, I, I think it comes up a lot. I, I think I've had so many people, Greg, say, well, I, I do know God forgave me and I know my spouse has forgiven me. I can't forgive myself. And so what I, I try, you know, and I hear, I've heard that a number of times over the years. And it's just because we just, you know, either you realize how badly you hurt your spouse or you right. realize, you know, what you did and those things. That's and right. so I, I think what I say is, is that, that God has forgiven you. And if he's forgiven you, this creative universe that gave you life, what right do you have to not forgive yourself? Yes. I mean, you've really, you know, God forgives you and embrace that because Honestly, if you look at it from a spiritual standpoint, if the enemy can continue to keep you bound up by that, by not forgiving yourself, it limits what you can do. It limits your relationship with Christ. It really limits your relationship with other people because it's going to bleed out somewhere. Wow. And so I think sometimes I'll just say that you're giving, you're giving the enemy some power here. Wow. You're letting him continue to make you feel bad and guilty and shameful of something you're forgiven for that you don't need to feel bad about or shameful or guilty anymore because you're cleansed. He looks at you cleansed. Wow. Wow. That's so yeah. good. You know, I, I, the, the, the best story I've ever heard uh, when it comes to forgiveness. And it was from, it was from my, my father. Uh, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, my parents had gone to a, a Christian workshop. And in that workshop, they talked about going and asking forgiveness from anyone that you may have hurt in the past, and yet you've never asked them to forgive you. You've asked God to forgive you, but you've yeah. not you've not had a chance to ask that person uh, to forgive you. And so, I, I know that I know that I know that that happened because I ended up going to that exact seminar uh, ten years later. Uh, but because uh, yeah. I and I remember them sharing that that segment, and it made me remember that my parents came home from that workshop. And my dad and mom got us all in a huddle. I had an older sister who was 12. My younger brother was eight. Uh, my, and my other younger brother was six. And God got us, I mean, my family, my parents got us in this huddle in the living room. And my dad began to cry. And I'd never seen my dad cry before. But mm. um, he started crying. And then it went to bawling. And he was, uh, snot was running and all of that. And he starts choking out, um, I want to ask you kids to forgive me for the things I've done to hurt you, um, the things I've said, the, how I've disciplined you in anger, I've, uh, I've hurt your feelings, I've, I've uh, blown up uh, many, many times, I've hurt your mom, you've seen me, uh, you've seen us fight and yell at each other, there was no physical fight, but we just yelling at each other. Yeah. Um, would you please forgive me? And I remember in this huddle going, oh, yes, dad, I forgive you. I forgive yeah. you. Uh, please just quit crying because if dad, <laughs> there's, there's something bad going on, you know. But in, in literally in one minute, 
I don't know how I did it. I can't explain it, but I forgave my dad of all of the past, all of the present and all of the future, all in that one, all in that one minute. Yeah. Uh, now, do you think my dad may have hurt me uh, and disciplined me in anger after that? What, what, what would not. you guess? I would say he didn't. Well, he did. Did he? Yeah. He did. I mean, it depends human. on what, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've seen I've, humans make I thought mistakes. you were going to tell me this miracle story. Because yeah, <laughs> right. I've seen it happen. I've seen oh, it yes, happen yes. Time. And I, I know. I, you know and, and sometimes it just, yeah. My, my dad got so me he, so upset after that one time. I wanted to, I wanted to run away from home. But when, yeah. I, when I got over the initial being mad at him, okay, I, yeah. you know what I thought? I forgive that guy who was bawling that day in my living room. You know, the guy that just hurt my feelings just now? Uh, that wasn't my real dad. My real dad was that guy that was bawling that day in our living room. That's good. And then when I went off to college, um, uh, I went, you know, I, my, one of my roommates wanted to go out and drink and party and skip class. And you know what I would say when all the guys would invite me to the, to the bachelor's party, some guy was getting, yeah. got, got, uh, getting married. And so the bachelor's party, and they were going to invite some a uh, stripper to come to the, you know, to some, yeah. some somebody's apartment. You know what I said? I don't want to go. I don't want to go. They said, Greg, why don't you want to go? I, I just, I just want to go. You guys go have a good time. I, I, I'm not going. <laughs> I'm you going. know why? You know why I didn't want to go? Because I did not want to disappoint that guy that was balling that day in our living room. Um, and that wasn't the only time my dad asked us to forgive him. That was the first time. And then God used that over and over throughout his life. So I never had any really deep, deep wounds from my father because he fixed so many of them uh, by just humbling himself. And I realized that I was able to forgive my dad emotionally because I felt like he was hurting as bad as he had hurt me over how he had hurt me. And I think there's a that's a that's a big deal because sometimes I think it is too. Yeah, we can hurt our spouse or hurt one of our children, and we just say, "Oh, I'm I'm sorry," and they're going, "You know, you hurt me really bad," and yeah. it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like you're hurting as bad as you had hurt me over how you hurt me. How have you seen that when someone says, "Well, I've already forgiven them," or, 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 or I asked them for forgiveness and they didn't forgive me? Uh, you know that kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think it is. I think it, it depends on what the deal is. Like this lady I talked to, went to another state to see this guy again. He couldn't right. mess her life up again, you know. But I, I think, think if it, if it isn't in, in a family like you're talking about, and a father that's working on that, Very that good. he still might. And so I think what we what we want is for that person to ask for forgiveness and for us to see them. Re really wanted to change and trying to change. And I think you saw that in your dad because I did. I after did. that first time you saw him continue to, and I think children, you know, I tell parents that they feel like they've damaged their kids. And I say, children seem to be the most forgiving and hey. resil resilient people of their parents. They just are. And so I said, so you can, you can, what you think you have messed up, right. you've got time to heal that completely. And, and That's to so bring good. healing by the time they leave the house at 18, that, that you guys are a family, you guys are connected again, you know, in some powerful ways. Yes, I'm so, I'm, I, that is such a good word. And hey, can you share a story, uh, we kind of, uh, as, as we wrap up, but I would love for you to share a story of an absolute broken family, broken, looked like it was so broken there, is, that's never going to get restored. Can you give us a, a, a story of, a, of, of a, rest, a restoration in a family? Yeah, and it's uh, this is the awesome marriage uh, podcast. We also have a video, and this couple was was on. There's a couple I walked through this with, and wow. uh, their story of of how God redeemed this is incredible. But he kind of in a in a short story, he had he began having an affair with a person at work. Uh, then he started having an affair with another person at work. So he's having two people at the same time, and wow. his wife with three kids found out about it. She asked him to leave. Uh, he went through a deal of repentance. I'll come back. She let him come back. And two nights later, he was back with this other woman. Uh, and so she, I was talking yeah. to both of them and she said, I'm done. I, I, she said, I can't, I can't do this for myself. It's killing. Right. Right. So he 
went through a lot of counseling, a lot of soul searching, understanding, uh-huh. you know, where he, why he did what he did, which was really important for him. And it came from his family of origin. And then he just started saying, can I come over and uh, mow the lawn? I won't talk to you. I, I, you don't have to see me, but I'd like to mow the lawn for you. And he just kind of started serving her, which was her happened to be acts of service was her love language. Uh, and it took a year of him just being obedient. He wanted to just show up and let her see a change because he knew he'd walked in before and said, I'm changed. Everything is good. <laughs> you don't that stuff anymore. And, you right. know, and so she wasn't going to believe that, right. but she did. Right. Now they are back together. Their story is incredible of redemption uh, right. and what yeah. God did and healed that. And that's what I tell people. Some, I'm glad they let us tell their story. Uh, if, if people are looking for it, it's on the Austin Ray podcast and it's uh, yes. Arlie and Amber's story. And you can, it's because it's such a powerful healing. And so when people come in and say, well, there's been a fair stuff, I said, it can be healed. Hey. Now, you both got to work at it. You know, yeah. this guy laid his life down for his life. wife is what he did. I you so badly. I will do whatever. If you just want me to mow your grass the rest of my life and you wave at me every once in a while, I'll be there. I'll do it, you know? Wow. And she saw wow. that in him. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, that's so good. Uh, you know, uh, Kim, I was just going to ask you, what what advice would you give a family right now that is in a crisis? They, are, uh, they just don't like each other anymore. In fact, they're starting to, to listen to that lie that, you know, you never, uh, he never really loved me or I really never loved her yeah. or whatever. What advice would you give a family that is in a crisis right now uh, and, um uh, how would how would you how would you how would you advise that person right now? Yeah. Well, one, if there is if there's any kind of physical abuse, okay. you got to separate for a while. Okay. Just before that, before I say that, but but I would say there's hope. I think you need to find a Christian counselor. Christian counseling is a lot cheaper than divorce, Amen. and and it, and it saves your marriage. It doesn't push you apart from each other, yeah. and and I think you but you both got to commit to it. You know, if I have a couple come in and one's coming in, one's just coming in for counseling to say, well, I can check that box off. And I can usually tell pretty quick, but, but still sometimes coming in, they begin to see the value of it. Christian counseling, I think is so important. And then just teaching them to value each other, you know, to embrace the differences that have pulled them apart. And as a counselor, you just kind of dig in. Okay. Because a lot of times, Greg, people, I don't remember what we fought about, but he threw this at me. You know, I think then you remember what started it because you kind of get to where you fight over, anything right. and so i think that there's always there's always hope that god's got an end and he wants your marriage to be awesome i mean he does he so he didn't when he stood at when you stood at the altar and took your vows he was there with you he's always going to do his part always that's so good that's so good yeah. if a cup if kim if a couple came to you and they had a family identity what would you do what 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 would that do for you to how, how would you help them have an awesome marriage Oh yeah, I think it, 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 be, it almost sounds great. Right? It's like, get that in front of us, bring that in. Let's talk about what that is. Where did you get off base? Does it need to be refined? Maybe it is, you know, and I think that can be a work in progress maybe as you That's grow right. and your spouse grows and your That's kids right. grow. But where did you get off track there? And then you've got kind of a, a focus point that they agreed on at one time, which yeah. makes it real easy, a much easier than someone that never had that at all. And you're, you know, you're just still trying to be together in some way well they already came together and so, so i think good. we go back together with this and we and let's get back on track with this this is what you both believed in i know this has happened but let's get back on track and so i think for me it gives me a roadmap to start with that a lot of times takes a long time to develop. that's so good uh kim how could somebody uh we have lots of families that have been through family id and uh and that that, that will be listening to this uh, to this interview, and I would love for them to be able to get in contact with you. How can they get, and how can they find uh, good Christian counseling that would really be biblically based? How can they get in touch with you, uh, and and you can maybe uh, guide and direct them? Sure. Uh, always email me at drkimadawesomemarriage.com. Uh, right. Are you? And there's ways to message us through our awesomemarriage.com website. Uh, okay. We've got 
all of our resources. We've got some great resources. One that I really love is a weekly couple checkup and the couples that are doing that. It's really just spending about 30 minutes once a, most couples do it on Sunday afternoon and it's just getting in touch with each other. It keeps you more connected. So we've got all kinds of resources like that. The one thing that. email, you can sign up for that from there. Okay. Uh, the podcasts are helpful. And, and as far as, um, yeah, we, we can help with Christian counseling. The American Association of Christian Counselors does have a referral page on their website. It's aacc.net. Right. And you can put in your zip code and they'll show you the Christian counselors in your area. And so they're members of the same association that we are. I've always had very good luck with this. I've never had anybody come back and say that person wasn't a Christian or that person didn't use biblical principles. So I think that gives people a resource there. But yes, so there good. is nothing wrong with going to counseling. It, I it, love you it. know, and even it, and maybe sometimes, you know, sometimes I think people go to, to a seminar we do or like they do the family ID weekend and they come out and think, well, we're, we're set. And then all of a sudden they fight again and they think, you know, what happened here? Well, right. you're still in the process. You're still processing growing and we all need. Nancy and I have been to counsel. Uh, the other thing I think it's great for couples is, is to have a mentor couple. If you can find, we tried to always find a couple that was a stage ahead of us. And we had a couple of couples poured into us so well and so valuable uh, over our, in the early part of our marriage. And oh. we do that now for, for younger couples. Then oh, we flip the script man. a little bit. Oh, man. Thank you so much, uh, Kim. You, God's favor and blessing are on you. And hey, would you... Um, uh, would you be willing to just say a, a, a prayer over these families, the family ID families uh, that sure. are going to be watching this? Uh, would you just pray over them and then I'll let you go. Thank you. Dear Father, uh, thank you for Greg and our friendship. Thank you for the abilities you've given him in this, this incredible ministry, Lord. And Lord, I pray for the couples that through this, that, that have their family identity, Lord, that, um, that you would keep the enemy from them that you would help them to stay focused on you and, and the goals and the identity that they decided on together. And, and Father, they would be encouraged and they would encourage each other. And um, but I know it takes work. A, a great marriage, an awesome marriage takes work. And so in those times when it seems hard that you encourage them and that they can encourage each other in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Kim. God bless Thanks, you. Greg. Thanks for being on today. Have a great day. Good to see you. Thanks. Bye. You too.